Jen to thank for this interview because last April, she and her new husband, Jim, came to DC for a conference and she said, have you ever heard of this book, Cynical Theories? You need to get it and you need to read it. Um, and she said, I said, oh, I love, I love books on tape. She goes, no, no, it's way too complicated to listen to. You actually have to get it and read it. I think you'll like it. So I said, oh, okay, I'm really busy. I'm going to just listen to a few podcasts by this guy to see if I like them, um, and then maybe I'll read the book. Well, that has turned into the last six months of my life being a constant James Lindsay number one fangirl. <laughs> James, I love you. Your information is incredible. And when we decided to, to invite James to come speak, um, we were organizing the conference and people said, well, well, what can he talk about? Like, what are you going to ask him to talk about? Um, and I said, well, he talks on CRT, he talks on DEI, he talks on e ESG, he talks on SEL, he talks on Marxification of education. He talks on every single issue that we care about. So I wanted to just have a conversation rather than to have you come and, and talk on one of those issues. Let's just have a conversation about all of them Hopefully, we'll hit as much as we can. And I, James, I just want you to know, first of all, that um, you are now on the SPLC hate list. Uh, he likes to go by General Hate. And Eagle Forum has been on that list for, I think, a decade. We, we started out being on their immigration hate list, which, you know, immigration, we care about it, but it's not like our number one issue. But uh, we're still on that, so we share that in common. But let's get into a little bit. Um, as I said, you've written about all these issues, critical race theory, DEI, the whole critical theories. Um, what do you think is the overarching theme that unites a lot of the things that you write about? What is the, the woke discourses? So uh, I'll just warn you that this is the hardest question. Um, <laughs> I looked over the questions and I thought, oh my god. What unifies all these things? I mean, there, there are a lot of ways to answer it. Um, there are kind of friendly ways, and there are more blunt ways. The blunt way is Marxism. Uh, Marxism unites all of these things. Uh, the idea in general is to create the illusion of unity that's really very isolating. You're no longer an individual who gets to know other individuals. You're some kind of a identity category. You're a representative of your race. You're a representative of your sex or sexuality or whatever gender identity is that's made up. And as that thing, you lose your individual humanity and you take on all the baggage that left-wing cultural Marxists have attached to that category. And so the idea is to create the illusion of unity where it's really creating, creating division. It's to create and stoke envy all of them are, are what are formally known as conflict theories. It's not just how do we understand conflict, which is how they, of course, lie and portray what a conflict theory is. They say, well, you know, society's stratified. There are haves, there are have-nots. There are privileged, there are oppressed. And so they're intrinsically in class conflict, whether that's economic class, racial class, sexual class, whatever. And we've got to raise class consciousness, feminist consciousness, race consciousness, and we've got to you know, work out the fact that they are intrinsically in conflict because of the stratification, the, the some people have and some people don't, the privileged versus oppressed. But that's not really what they mean by a conflict theory. It's actually how do you generate conflict between these groups? Uh, how do we, class consciousness means how do we wake up the working class to believe that their, their life is terrible so they'll revolt against the society uh, and, and the people that they think are holding them down. And so what unites them is, is, is Marxist analysis. I gave a talk at the European Union Parliament in March and I said that if you start thinking of Marxism as a theology, kind of as a very broad religion, all of these things are denominations. There, it's, you know, you've got, pick your favorite Protestant theology, you know, Protestantism is broken into 30,000 denominations. It's the same thing. So if you take economics as what forms man's experience in the world, you get classical Marxism. If you take race as what forms man's experience in the world, you get CRT. But it's all the same Marxist analysis on down the line. So we can think of those. I said in, in Europe, I said they're like, you know, with, with species, and it's like Marxism is a genus of ways to think about the world. And then you have all these different individual species, Marxism, CRT, queer theory, 
ability studies. I think I just read something about sanism uh, the other day, and I'm still reeling from it, which is the unfair privileging of sane people over insane. <laughs> in the Canadian, edu there, are, there, there are educational facilities in, in Canada, in Ontario, that are taking this very seriously and trying to move insanity deliberately and intentionally into early childhood education and care, which is just extraordinarily alarming, uh, in my opinion. What is their purpose behind this conflict theory? Power. The purpose okay. behind conflict this is to generate conflict so they can can take advantage of the conflict to, to take power. Um, that, that's all it is. It, it, it's a form of taking certain people and weaponizing their ability to claim power over others. You have to acknowledge my pronouns or else you're so bad that we can get you fired or, you know, whatever else. It, it's just power. It, so their, their goal is, I mean, this is a small scale. This is a practical scale. Their goal is power. The big scale why do they want this power? What's deeper is, as a matter of fact, I don't think Vivek Ramaswamy was wrong in saying, for example, that transgender is a mental illness. I actually go further. I think leftism, and to be distinguished from liberalism, leftism is a mental illness. And the goal is, in fact, to claim power so that you can force the world to conform to your delusion or fantasy. You make the whole world participate if it's... Um, Queer theory, I think it's very obvious, especially with the trans. You're trying to force people to participate in the delusion that men can sometimes be women and vice versa. With CRT, my analysis from early on, but as it's developed, the more I read CRT, the more I'm convinced it's, it's grifter ideology. The whole thing is designed to empower certain people to be able to complain using racial characteristics as the tool to complain so that they can gain advantage for themselves. And we look at things like Black Lives Matter that are rooted in it, and what, what do we see? Charitable fraud upon charitable fraud. It's, it's grifters. But what they want is the power to shape the world so that it conforms to their pathologies. Uh, and I think that that's a, at the very bottom of what's going on there. You talk in your podcasts about Gnosticism, and you just mentioned your speech at the European Union and how some of these theories, it's all like comparing it to Protestantism and all the different denominations. Um, tell us about your Gnosticism uh, formula and why is it important for us, the activists, to recognize that and identify when it's happening? I do like the privilege of getting to talk about this in front of Christian audiences or broadly Christian audiences because they actually know what Gnosticism is frequently or at least sort of. They recognize that it is one of the, maybe the oldest heresy against Christianity, and of course there were um, Gnostic strains of Judaism that preceded Christianity. Uh, and I think that Marxism is Gnosticism. I think that all of these woke ideologies, why are they woke? Because they woke up to a secret hidden truth that can save them from the pitfalls of the world or from the, the injustices of the world. They can elevate themselves you know, out of the morass of the material world and into a higher spiritual world, but they see the spirit in the social and increasingly in the digital, which ties into what you guys have been talking about all morning. The spiritual is being replaced by sociality and, and sociology, really. So I think that what happened is in the early 19th century, late, seven, uh, late 18th and early 19th, so that's Rousseau, Kant, Hegel, and then Marx through the middle of the 19th century, that um, a modern era or kind of post-Enlightenment, uh, more material Gnostic religion was born, and that's what all of these things are, and that since we've ignored that and think treat it as an economic theory and we treat it as a social theory, then, then we miss completely what's going on. So what is Gnosticism? Gnosticism is the belief that the world was created by an evil demon that imprisons all of us in the world, in our bodies, in, in reality, in material, the material world itself, in being is itself is a prison. And if you actually take the time to go read some woke literature, you will be shocked, now that I've said this to you, how often they use metaphors like being imprisoned, being incarcerated. The left approaches the issue of abortion as though they are incarcerated by their own fertility, which unfortunately the right often has reified for them by saying quippy things like, do the crime, uh, pay the time, or whatever. And, and it's like, that's how the left already thinks about, about the idea is that they're shackled to a fertility they didn't ask for that can wipe away the imaginary picture that they had for their life going forward. And 
what they believe is that, I mean, what the ancient Gnostics believed is that the character in Genesis referred to as God is in fact what the Greeks would call the demiurgos, which means artisan, builder, creator. So the creator of the world is actually a demon that imprisoned man in the garden. And then when man rebelled and took the step that might free him from his imprisonment by eating from the fruit, he was cast out into the material world of suffering in further imprisonment, uh, even further removal. And what the, the the demiurge creates this whole, you know, worship me instead of God as a religion. That's where all of Judaism and Christianity come from, but we can a- attain an understanding of ourselves and who we really are as spiritual beings and elevate out of that problem. That's the Gnostic religions, which many Christians will readily identify with Satanism. Uh, usually it's all about the self. It is a religion, really, of the self. What happens with with Hegel and Marx in particular in the 19th century, is that they started to see the social forces, the bourgeoisie, is the the constructor of the world we live in, and or CRT, it's white people created racial categories like whiteness and blackness and imposed a racism that is a permanent legacy that we can never get away from, and it structures our reality. They actually call it structural determinism, and the Marxists before that called it material determinism, that we are determined by the structures of society built out by these things. And by attaining secret self-knowledge that we are, for Marx, ultimately social creatures, in fact socialists, who have been lured into forgetting that through the ideology of capitalism, through the idea of private property and the division of labor, or the division of the races in CRT, or the division of the sexes for feminism, or the division of gender identity, which is made up in the first place. It's not even real uh, in queer theory. Because the the idea, we are separated by these things. We've lost track of who we really are. And so where the Christian heresies of the first century believed that they had the gnosis of the true spiritual nature of reality so we could escape the suffering of being, the prison of being. In the 18th and 19th century, they created these social theories where the Holy Spirit is the zeitgeist or the weltgeist, the world spirit or the spirit of the times, the way culture is moving, and it's shaping people's lives. And the only way to escape it is to realize that you can actually diverge from it, whether you're talking about Rousseau and his complete, you know, rejection of uh, social norms, or are you talking about Nietzsche who said that freedom comes from from cri- criticizing morality, the Superman is the person who's thrown off all morals. Of course, Nietzsche went crazy and died of being crazy, so it didn't work out. On down the line, th- they created a social religion that ultimately believes that if you know the secret truth about how race is constructed or how sex is constructed, and how it's used to include certain people and exclude certain people, just like I mentioned a minute ago, include the sane and exclude the, in, the insane unfairly, then you understand the architecture of their thought, but you also understand why this is ultimately, therefore, as people have been saying in the Christian world for many, many years, a spiritual battle way before it's a political or an economic or a social battle. This is all about having putting put quite literally a demonic religion in place of sociology and economics and let that run for 150 to 200 years. Wow. Um, Now, your background is that of a mathematician. And how did you come from... I'm not a mathematician. I'm a lawyer. Um, That's way worse. law Law school's for all the people that didn't do well in math. But how did you go from... It it really is. Um, How did you go from a mathematician's background into getting into this and seeing this whole Gnostic kind of framework for the world? Can you tell us a little bit about your... um, your path. Yeah, I mean, this is a whole story. We I won't spend call the rest it a transition. Time talking about a story. Yeah, there's no <laughs> transing involved. Um, the first thing that happened, and I'll try to make this really succinct, I got fed up with academia in the last few years I was doing my, my PhD. I didn't like the course that it was taking to try to main, you know, prim, put primary student retention over other goals. How do we keep the students here? How do we keep them paying tuition? That was literally put as a priority for education. I said, oh, I can't teach math honestly in these conditions. I had other competing interests like a family to deal with. I didn't want to do the whole academic, drag my family around the country while I go postdoc to postdoc, trying to get a permanent academic job. Um, 
so I just said, I'm going to leave academia. And the next thing you know, I'm arguing online with feminists. And I mean, there's some details left out of the story, but I actually took them seriously enough. I said, you know what, fine, show me what you're talking about. Send me some articles. Let me read what you're talking about. And I read some of their popular press stuff, and I read some of their academic stuff. And I came away and I said, okay, I understand the idea of sexism being systemic, but that's systemic sexism, and then there's regular sexism, and they're not the same thing, and you're accusing people in a blurry way between the two. And um, you're just calling people sexists when really they're not being sexist at all. And the, the woman I was talking with at the time said they're the same thing. And that's when I realized something was badly wrong. So I started to read more of it. At first, kind of lightly and casually, I had better things to do. And then I got more and more involved. Eventually, many of you will have heard in 2017 and 18, I spent the majority of those two years writing a series of fake academic articles, hoax articles, that I submitted to high-ranking academic journals with two colleagues. And... Um, we got seven of them accepted. We still had seven under peer review when the Wall Street Journal discovered what we were up to. And these things were properly sometimes funny and ridiculous and sometimes really scary, the things that we made up to see if we could get it through peer review in academic journals, realizing that academic journals are the things that say when senators are sitting around and saying, well, there's a study that says that's what they're referring to. And so that becomes very important uh, in terms of, of where our society goes. Well, we wrote these ridiculous articles, got a bunch through. A sociologist, after the fact, said 12 of the 20 papers we wrote would have got through. And most importantly, starting in roughly January 2018, we got the knack of it. All of them were getting in at that point. We 100% success rate once we figured out the, the trick. And so in the process of that, one of the papers we wrote was about education, and we thought it would be rather humorous to say that we're going to order the kids by their privilege by various means, and we're going to abuse the kids who have privilege so that they learn what it's like to be oppressed, and, and we're going to do it with compassion because we wanted it to be funny. And so we'll abuse them compassionately out of their privilege. And they wrote back, the peer reviewers for a very high-standing journal called Hypatia, the Journal of Feminist Philosophy, wrote back, and their peer reviewers said, we love this idea, but you can't use compassion. <laughs> because compassion centers the needs of the privileged over the needs of the oppressed. And so we recommend instead this, this concept called the pedagogy of discomfort. So teaching through making people uncomfortable, which if you remember is exactly while cities in the United States burned in 2020, exactly what people like AOC said on TV. Change is supposed to be uncomfortable. You have to learn to be uncomfortable. You have to sit in your discomfort. That was, I was a, you know eyes wide open when I heard them saying these things. It wasn't just AOC. I just used her as an avatar of many bad things. Um, <laughs> People all over the country, all of whom had D's after their political identification, were using this language that change is supposed to be a matter of going through discomfort uh, and overcoming privilege is a matter of discomfort. And that's the Pedagogy of Discomfort, which was written by Megan Bowler in 1998 in a book called Feeling Power. I mean, I know all about this. I was like, oh, no. But when I got that feedback, I sat on it and thought about it for a while, and I realized that the end of this road is, is a genocide. We're going to abuse, we're going to identify certain groups of people who are intrinsically privileged for reasons beyond their control. We're going to abuse them out of their privilege and compassion's off the table. Their story has been told. You need to sit down and shut up. These are the very beginning levels of what ends in something horrific, like we see either from the Nazis or more likely the communist regimes uh, throughout the 20th century. And I said, this ends in genocide. So I get accused, Chris, a lot of not having any courage on the internet. And so I went to my wife and I went to my lovely bride and I said, I think that the end, the, this thing I'm doing isn't funny anymore and it's the end of the world. And I would like to quit my job and spend all of my time and effort studying and exposing it for people. And she looked me in the eyes being, um, we're old school, so she's really a woman. Um, <laughs> she looked me in the eyes and said, can you make money doing that? kind of blinking, and I said, I don't know, and she very graciously gave me 18 months to try, <laughs> it, but at the same time, like I said, she really is a woman. This isn't some identi identity thing. 18 months meant 15 months, but <laughs> we got the plane off the ground at any rate, and so I did. I dedicated my entire 
my entire life. I mean, mostly almost every waking hour that I have to studying, reading, and talking about this, trying to figure out how to communicate it to people. Because I realized that this is the unraveling of Western civilization with all of the probably billions of deaths that follow if we don't stop it. Wow. That's, you have a very smart wife because she's thinking. Yeah, she's pretty good. Um, yeah, th thinking about like, this is great. That's a nice, I, I think I do that with my husband sometimes. That's, that's wonderful, honey, but. We've had some retrospective since, and she said much more frank things about what she thought at the okay. time. <laughs> She's being supportive, right? She was being supportive. <laughs> she yes, thought I had lost my mind. Wow. And then you found out who really had lost their mind was, was the other side. Um, let's talk a little bit about, and I think this is what you were just talking about, what the left is doing in terms of political warfare. This, you, you know, you said it is a spiritual battle. We all, as Christians in this room, think it is a spiritual battle, but it is political warfare. Um, and as Molly Hemingway just said regarding the suppression of information on the internet, wh what are these radical Marxists, American Maoists, doing in terms of political warfare? And is there a way for us to counter that or fight back on that? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. So political warfare, I've been saying this for a few years, um, is the most important concept you've probably never heard of. Political warfare is using political means, which means not weapons-based means to get a target to do what you want them to do with hostile intent. And that's the, the definition of political warfare. The left is operating by political warfare tactics. Marxists, until they seize power, ultimately always advance through political warfare, which you might call subversion or infiltration or entryism. They have lots of different names for different things that they do to get inside and take over institutions from within, subvert their intentions, subvert the values, to use people's values against them. Uh, to craft narratives, to run propaganda through narrative arcs that then become true. They aren't true when they say them. They become true later by ginning people up into doing a reaction that proves the case they were making. Oh, there's rising anti-LGBTQ hate in the country. So they provoke and provoke and provoke and provoke until finally people are sick of it and they say, look, we told you it was there all along. Same thing as, you know, there's racism right under the surface. That's CRT. Racism, racism, racism. Look, Donald Trump got nominated as president, and he's a racist. Only a racist country would do that. They made the story become true by agitating. These are, these are political warfare techniques. In the 1990s, it turns out the Communist Party of China, which, according to after Vivek Ramaswamy said that in the debate the other day, there was another fact check of him saying that, uh, I guess this was Washington Post, since we're here in town, said that... Um, he very inappropriately said that the anti-Asian sentiment from the Indian guy that uh, the Chinese Communist Party is a problem. We're, the, you're not allowed to do that now. Uh, but the Chinese Communist Party in the 90s assessed that the United States was great with, with physical warfare machinery, but its capacity for political warfare had been so degraded that it may as well not exist. That was their remark. And so it's propaganda, it's subterfuge, it's infiltration, and they are extremely good at it. They're practiced at it. They have, they look crazy, but they actually have manuals. They know what they're doing. They're doing it very, very well. And the goal is to get people to react the way they want them to, to convince people of things that aren't true by blending contexts together, by mystifying, really, to use Marx's favorite word for these things, by mystifying a low-information, low-engagement public to support their initiatives like they're the good thing, like they're the caring people, where in fact they're on a rampage of destruction. It can be countered after we understand what it is, and then we find out that there are actually not that many very simple patterns that they follow over and over and over again. And when you pull back the veil and show people what they're doing, not only do they see through it, which can take some work at first, but then they realize they're being manipulated, at which point they don't trust that. So it's like giving them an inoculation against the, the propaganda because they, they, when you lose trust in the person telling you something, you immediately get suspicious uh, of, of, of what you're being told. And so this is actually something we've all got to start learning to do, is to see their narratives, the way they build their narratives, the way they choose targets with their narratives, and to um, take those apart so that other people can see that they are manipulating us. I mean, COVID has been as devastating as ineffective as it was, and a tremendous gift in this regard. Donald Trump, I know he's not everybody's favorite cup of tea, but when he said fake news, he did it for 
millions and mil- hundreds of millions of people, if nothing else, the man saying those two words, and I guess the Supreme Court justices, works out to have been a tremendous advantage to us. Fake news was probably the two most important syllables that have been uttered uh, in, in the recent, in maybe the last 50 years of politics, because it burst a bubble that was the propaganda machine that Molly was talking about that people couldn't see through. But when you can see through it, you can expose it. You can say, here's the propaganda, here's what it says, here's what they want you to believe, and here's what's really true, which takes a lot of work. But you don't have to do that work that many times to get people to stop trusting and start being skeptical and doing that work for themselves uh, by, by pu- I get, again, pulling back the curtain and showing them how how this all works. So would you say the um, there's a lot of our our activists in the room who are are very um, active in the the removing or highlighting the inappropriate books in public libraries and school libraries. Would you say that an illustration of this is when people get up and actually read the book? Is that yes? And everybody should send Senator Kennedy a thank you note <laughs> for doing that in the Senate. Um, so I assume everybody in the room knows what's going on with the inappropriate library books. And what you don't realize is that what you're being brought into is a political warfare tactic called a decision dilemma. So they put something in front of you. This is also called mid-level violence or middle-level provocation. It's a toe over the line. It's not all the way over the line. I saw some wide eyes when the pornographic books are traded as a toe over the line. They're not doing far more gratuitous things that will come later uh, if it's not stopped. So what you are put into is a position where you either do nothing and therefore allow it and all the damage that it brings, or you do something and you immediately get framed as a book banner. And Which is funny because it's not funny. The left very artfully did this, very intentionally. They are and were banning books. To Kill a Mockingbird, Huckleberry Finn, we can go down the list. They were, ban- Dr. Seuss, they were banning books, and now it's allegedly Moms for Liberty and conservative moms that are banning books because they were lured into this trap of going and standing up and saying, we want these books taken out of the library. Oh, you want books banned, gotcha. And that was a very subtle dialectical trap that was set. Well, what breaks a decision dilemma is turning it back around on the other person by getting the watching audience there. Everything they do is scripted for, the, it's like they're doing a play for, for an audience. The, one of their principles is play to the audience that isn't there. Another is their do the media's work for them. And in their language again and again and again, if you where it's talking about getting a reaction, they're saying anticipate your opponent's reaction and write that into your script. That's the language they use in their activist manual called Beautiful Trouble. So what they want is to create this performance for a low information, low engagement audience that mystifies them as to what's really going on by making sure they don't understand the context. For example, I went to one of these booths that they'd set up to protest Monster Liberty, and they said, did you know these people in there are banning books? And I was like, really? What books? And they showed me a bunch of books. None of the books are books that are in question. They were doing a propaganda operation at the table. They were giving very innocuous books and saying, these are the books that these moms want to ban. 100% of those books was a lie. 100% of those books was completely benign. But they were about topics like immigration or race or whatever else. And a low information, low engagement person would look at these sweet books and be horrified. But they don't have a copy of, say, Gender Queer on the table with its explicit sexual content in, in the book. Or Lawn Boy or Blue or whatever the other. There are thousands of these things. There are thousands of them now. They didn't have any of the real books. And so when you read the book in public, what happens is it flips the dynamic over. They have to either cut your microphone, in which case they're censoring you, or they have to allow you to pull back the curtain and show people what really is going on. When you show up and you have a copy of the book, I know you don't want to give them royalties. I've written lots of books. It's like 80 cents. It's okay. (laughs) Buy physical copies of these books. Put them in your bags. Take them places and show them to people. It's horrifying to see the physical, it's not the same as seeing it in digital. It's horrifying to see it in print. And when you do this, when you read those books, it puts them in a decision dilemma instead of you. You've taken back the ground where now, technically you're on offense, and it's extraordinarily offensive. Another one is I got very famous for saying okay groomer to people. 
And so I got pinned by a journalist, by the way, this never got aired, so you're not going to be able to go hear it, so you have to take my word, word for it, talking to the BBC, and the very British, most British moment of my life, I think, the guy said, well, aren't you uh, kind of dangerous because you go around accusing people of being groomers? And I said, well, let me read something to you. And I read a paragraph from the Drag Queen Story Hour academic paper arguing for it in schools, and it says that the presence of the drag queen, and I quote from memory, is a preparatory introduction to alternate modes of kinship, such that the children are taught to live queerly. So I read that to him, and I said, I'm not allowed to use the word groomer. What word should I use? And he went, oh, <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> they didn't air that, of course. But I put it back on him. So his next line was even more ridiculous, and he said, but don't you think it's dangerous to point it out? <laughs> and I was like, no, I think it's dangerous not to point it out. And you see that I claimed all, all the ground, but what I did, it's not that I'm clever. I read their materials. I showed them what, I pulled back the, the, the fuzzy context of nobody knows what we're talking about, and I read word for word where it could no longer be denied, where he couldn't even deny. And in fact, he was, by the way, he laughed about it, taken aback to have actually heard it, which is what we saw with Senator Kennedy when he read the book in the Senate, the AG from uh, Illinois, who has photographs of him supporting the book. It was, those words are very disturbing coming out of your mouth. Well, how do you think they are going into the head of a seven-year-old or whatever? Yeah, come on. Yeah. So this is an extremely effective tactic. The idea with the decision dilemma is I'm not touching you, I'm not touching you, I'm not touching you. And the way that you deal with the decision dilemma, because or the, the, the I'm not touching you game, that particular one, because you know it's all about either mom or dad who's watching and is going to come down with thunder when you put a hand up. If my brother was doing it to me and I slapped my brother's hand, mommy hit me, and mom's going to come down on me with thunder, and I received a lot of thunder growing up of this, of this sort. The way that you actually deal with it is you make sure mom knows what's really going on. You've got your finger in my face. It's not acceptable. I'm not talking to mom. You've got my, your finger in my face. It's not acceptable. If you don't stop, I'm going to retaliate so that mom can hear it. And if I know mom heard it now, he either puts it down or I get to hit him, and I'm the big brother, so it's going to work out. <laughs> And so that idea, though, that you're always needing to be cognizant of the low information audience that needs to know what the context of the circumstance is before you act allows you to break through most of their spells. All you have to do is bring the full context. Read the book. Read a piece of their academic literature to them. That's why my podcast is largely me reading their academic literature to people. See what's really there in an undeniable form. Show, don't tell. And when the watching audience gains the context, what they usually do is they bail out. They give up on the provocation because they're going to lose. They're unacceptable. And people know they're unacceptable. But if they don't know why these things are happening and they have a you know, 2 out of 10 understanding of the, of, of the context of what's going on, they're, the left is extremely good at getting people to think that they're the ones championing the right thing versus the wrong thing. And they'll make you look bad every single time if you don't, don't clarify context first. Excellent. Um, you wrote another book. I think this is your most recent one. That's right. Called The Marxification of Education. And again, it's, it's a, a fantastic book. You go through Paulo Ferreri. I don't even know how to say Freddy. it. Freddy. I asked a Brazilian. What is it? Freddy. Freddy? I okay. said it wrong the whole time. Okay. I asked a Brazilian lady recently. She told me it's Freddy. Um, about critical Marxism, the theft of education. Um, and so this is a little bit more about the education system in our country. What things can our activist parents do in this room to help counter some of this stuff? Well, I mean, since it's all political warfare tactics, the first thing you actually have to understand is what and how they're doing it. That's why I wrote this book. I argue that, they, that the Marxists have stolen our education from our society and our children, stolen it. And I have been giving some talks recently, one here in D.C. last week, one in, at, the, at the CNP meeting um, a couple, of, I guess the week before in, in uh, Scottsdale, where I've been saying that they stole the three component parts of education, the purpose of education, replace it with credentialism that they control, 
They control what credentials count and what they mean. They stole the idea of education and turned it into uh, political literacy instead of actual literacy or numeracy or whatever else. They use the educational content as an excuse to have a political conversation. And then the mechanism of, edu- of how they stole education is how they actually do that. How do they turn a math lesson into a political conversation? That's what that book was written to uh, clarify for parents and teachers around the country who know that they're doing CRT or queer theory or gender stuff or whatever. I try not to use gender ideology because that's our word for it. Um, it's not theirs. It's not in their literature anywhere. It's actually critical gender theory or, or gender critical feminism, uh, depending on how far advanced it is. But at any rate, I wanted people to understand how that that is done. How are they swapping out the conversations? And that's what that book is about. So if you don't know how they're doing it, I can assure you, you are not ready to be able to go and stop them from doing it. It's like if I'm up here and let's say I'm a magician and I keep making the queen of hearts disappear and appear behind your ear. If you don't know how I'm getting it there, you're never going to stop me. Or if I'm a little more advanced at this, I keep making a $20 bill disappear out of your wallet and making the queen of hearts replace it. You're never going to stop me from stealing you unless you know how I'm doing the magic trick. And the second you see where, you know, I've hidden the card or reached and got this or distracted you, then you can actually say, no, this is exactly what you're doing. So it has to start with knowing what's happening. There's a huge educational learning curve here, and I hate it. I've gone for years, and people want a shortcut. There's not a shortcut. You've got to learn how they do their manipulations. You've got to learn what they're doing. And then you actually have to show up and give concrete examples. You have to be ready to file lawsuits where there are injuries. You have to encourage lawmakers um, in particular, and sometimes attorneys general, to open pathways to action, legal action, uh, because for example, we look at the, it's a little slightly different story, but we look at the state of Missouri just recently changed the the picture for medical liability with transgender care, which is another lie. It's mutilation, not care. And all of a sudden the university hospital at Washington University said, well, we can't do that stuff anymore because it's, there's too much legal exposure for us. It's too much liability. So if you can get pathways to action, they know what they're doing is wrong. You can't appeal to their better nature. They don't have one. They know what they're doing is wrong. They're suppressing goodness to continue doing what they're doing. So you're not going to appeal to them on be a better person. They will, however, respond to lawsuits. And lawsuits in a civil society are the equivalent of force without having to use force. So we have to have pathways to action and encourage our lawmakers to create those. All of this ban this, ban that, the other thing that we're trying to do in legislatures is going to be a very limited utility because it's just going to be more grist for their mill. It's going to be dragged out long Supreme Court case, maybe if it gets that far. Sometimes it's going to work out, and sometimes it's not. The Sixth Circuit just recently ruled that um, the, the, one of the bans in Tennessee is being upheld. We'll see what happens with that next. But the, the, the fact of the matter is that opening pathways for injured people parties to sue is going to do a lot more. I can tell you that the transgender phenomenon will take a drastic nosedive if all you do is extend the statute of limitations for the parties that are involved in it to sue until they're 45 years old or something like that. Mm -hmm. Let them grow up and let them change their mind and tell them they can sue if they do, and the whole thing's going to take a nosedive. So we've got to be thinking in that way. But the main thing that you have to do is protect your kids. And I wish I didn't have to say this. I'm product of public schools. I think they did me all right. Uh, maybe I would have done better. You've got to protect your kids from this stuff. And right now, I don't see any way short of homeschool um, to protect your children. I'm not saying that that's the only permanent solution, but I am saying that for right now, the schools, mostly even private schools, are so enthralled with this ideology through everything through the the licensure the accreditation the s- fact that private schools serve schools like Harvard that want this there are just very few pathways out of out of this to protect your children in the short term other than figuring out how you can get them out of the environment you guys have been talking about tech i talked with a doctor when i was in san francisco like 2 days ago uh, a physician and surgeon and he said that um, i talked about how sometimes in my life i traveled abroad and i've had to put my phone you know i've gone to china the firewalls there, can't get on social media for two weeks. And then after about two weeks, I can't figure out why people use social media. And I told this to the to the physician, and he said, yeah, that's because all the receptors in your brain reset. It takes about two to three weeks. Same thing. I've seen so many young people who are 
you know, 12, 13 years old, they're trans, all of a sudden, you know, their name is Theodore now or whatever, and they're, they're a boy. And the remedy is take their device away, take them out of school, and in three weeks, guess what? They're a little girl again. It's you remove them from the contaminating environment. Their, their brains are not wired to be able to handle this relentless propaganda, the relentless affirmation of these evils through their authority figures and their, their teachers. Removing them from the environment is often the single best cure for almost all of the divisiveness, the psychological assault, mutilation that's going on. I'm not talking even about the physical stuff. The psychological manipulation requires removing them from the manipulating environment for probably the majority, wide majority of, of people, adults as well. If you don't believe me, we we're talk somebody said something about, you know, it's Molly said something about digital Sabbath. See if you can do it. Turn off your social media for two weeks. See if you understand why people use social media at the end. It's been I've had this experiment done like six times as I've gone to China, and I've just decided not to try to get around the firewall. And it's shocking. I look at Twitter and I think, why do people use this? And I'm a pretty prime Twitter offender as it goes under normal circumstances. It's, it is an addiction, and it takes two to three weeks to cure, and you can cure your children of it, whether it's from the devices or whether it's from, from the propaganda they're getting at school uh, or through even their entertainment. Do you think, uh, you're on Twitter a lot, um, do you think that the argument is that we need to be on Twitter so that we can communicate these ideas with people who have not had the curtain pulled back on them? Um, so having had these um, sabbaticals from Twitter, but yet you're still back there because you think it's useful for yeah. getting your message out and... It is unfortunately Talk to us a bit about that. Yeah, it's unfortunately the most useful platform, maybe short of one of the video platforms like YouTube or, or Rumble to get a message out. Uh, so what you have to do is you have to understand that it's a tool. You have to learn how to use it. If the tool owns you, that's really bad. But if you make use of the tool, then good. Now, this is going to be a personal thing. Different people have different tolerances for different things. But what I have found for me personally is that um, – the if the more I use this is kind of you know nerd speak, but the more I use social media in the write only mode, that's W R I T E only, like used to have on computers, read only, write only. So what I do is I don't read the feedback that I get. If I don't look at what people say back to me, it doesn't get into my head. It doesn't get addictive. I don't. I, have, I am blessed with a very large Twitter account now, 430 some odd thousand followers. I get so many freaking notifications, I can't look at them. I, there's just too many. And that's one of the biggest blessings. I started watching, my wife had an account and it only had, you know, like 85 followers. Every single thing anybody does showed up as a notification on her phone. I don't, Twitter doesn't give me most of my notifications because there's just too many. I get something like 50 or 60,000 a day. And... I became to the point where I no longer cared if I get likes or comments or retweets. I don't know how many I get. I don't look at them. The number doesn't mean anything to me. I only use that function intentionally as a barometer to see where my messaging is landing from time to time. And then every now and then I'm on an airplane and I have the Wi-Fi and I'm like, let's fight. Why not? <laughs> but every time I do that, I feel worse. Every single time I do that, I feel worse for two or three days afterwards. So I encourage you to learn how to use the tool to think through. What are your goals with the tool? What are you trying to accomplish? If you're trying to satisfy your social needs, you failed. It can't. It will make you miserable. That's why so many kids are part of why they're depressed and anxious. They're miserable. They go online to get a social interaction. They don't get one. I just saw a statistic that 30-something percent of young boys have never approached under... 30 or something like this. So not even young boys, young men have never approached a woman in real life and they can't figure out why they don't have a girlfriend. <laughs> it's like, you actually got to go talk to her, bro. Y you got to buck up. They want to see some of that. And they, you, you will not achieve your social life online. And if that's what you're using it for, you're off, you're off 
the rocker. It's going to be just a downward spiral. On the other hand, if you're using it to promote your ideas, if you're using it to promote content that you're producing, if you're a content producer, if you're using it to network, I have a lot of people in, that I know that use it to spy on the enemy. They have second accounts that they make, burner accounts as they're called, and all they do is follow a bunch of you know left-wing philanthropies and like see what they're up to. Figure out your purposes for it, and then you control the tool. Don't let the tool control you. But the more you rely on it as a social crutch, the more it will get into your head and control you. So that's, I think, the biggest pitfall. And coming back to the theme of the morning, as I've heard so far, young people don't have the, well, we're literally hearing about how it dissolves your free prefrontal cortex or something. They don't have the judgment capacity to be able to control the tool. So you're going to have to help help facilitate that for them, whatever is right for you and your family. But I think that that's very important. You, you've you got to use these tools. You should also let, recognize that they're the gulag. Our gulag is digital. If you want to have a voice, you sign up for the gulag and they brainwash you on it and they struggle session you on it. You get you say the wrong thing, they abuse you sometimes for days. You don't even know what happened and all of a sudden thousands of people are telling you you're terrible or that you're some other awful, you know, epithet. And that's a struggle session. That's straight out of Mao's prisons. But what we do in our country, instead of in Mao, we don't send people to prison for this. We tell them if they want to have a voice in the public, the digital public square, they sign up for their brainwashing. And if you're not prepared for that, you need to take a step back and get squared away before you get back in the fray. Mm, wow. Um, I, we could talk about uh, so many things. And like, I wanted to talk to you about SEL and and it's the, brainwashing. There you go. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the kids are all right. Well, the kids aren't all right. And SEL has been a big thing that was supposed to make the kids all right. But it has actually done the, the Yeah, opposite. that's a scam. Let me real quick. I know we're short on time. But let me just real quick say that UNESCO published an article a few years ago called SEL for SDGs. And what they admitted was that the DEI programs, the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, Education, Education for Global Citizenship, uh, education for Sustainable Development is another one they, they call these things, actually causes kids cognitive dissonance, depression, and anxiety. They know that brainwashing kids is bad for kids, that they're not making them mentally well. And so they said, well, social-emotional learning is the perfect tool because it teaches them emotional resilience. And resilience is the big buzzword. I just encourage you to remember that leftist language is always loaded. Well, that's really alliterative. That was yeah, great. That's good. Leftist language is always loaded. And so it always means something different. And when you think about the word resilience, which is everywhere now, post pandemic, as if it was planned, maybe, uh, the word resilience is the opposite of fragility. And if you remember the concept of white fragility, it meant not taking your racial brainwashing well. Anything you did that didn't go along with being accused of racism and pledging to be a lifelong anti-racist was white fragility. If you disagreed, if you got mad, if you got upset, if you stayed silent, if you walked away, if you just ignored it, you said, no, I don't think so. White fragility, lack racial stamina, and so on. And what do you need in, in its place? You're going to need resilience. And so resilience means learning to take your brainwashing well. And that's where we see that the emotional resilience brought in by social-emotional learning is a program to use social and emotional tools to overcome the fact that they know that they're psychologically poisoning the kids with the with the lessons of whether it's critical theories, whether it's global citizenship, whether it's sustainable development and the SDGs specifically or DEI. They know it's bad for the kids. They know it's breaking them down. They know it's breaking them apart. And so this is their ready-made solution. They're breaking the kids and then saying, well, we need more of the thing that's breaking them because obviously it sounds like it would fix them. And they know this. They know this is what they're doing, and they've been writing articles about it for, for, for many years. So thank you very much. Thank you for speaking to our activists, and we hope you can stay for lunch. Yeah.